think it was Tuesday last time. What time did we start at? Number 12. 12.30. We're going to have a soup and a roll lunch, aren't we? That's the time we start the show together. So if anybody can make it. It's probably a game or two. We might play games. Yeah, some games as well, yeah. Not, not running around, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, just games to have some fun. Maybe board games, that sort of thing. So if you can make it, um, Tuesday, if you really get to see. Don't forget Wednesday evening if you can get along as well. We'll have a really good Bible study in Rome, so if you can make that, that'll be a real blessing for you yes. as well. The other thing is, it's a special day today. Yeah. This is George's birthday. Yeah. Yeah. So we're just saying happy birthday now. You, don't think, you, know, you know what they have words, don't you, I'm sure? And the second verse as well. So let's sing happy birthday. Understanding of the good news of 
the gospel, the understanding of your word. Lord, what, how blessed we are to be able to actually know that you sent the company of the Holy One to be with us. So be with us as we continue this morning. Take away the things that we're distracted us and take our attention away. May we just be, as it were, locked in here with you. And may we actually be in the Spirit, taken to be in your presence, Lord, as we sing the hymns, as we concentrate on you. May it be a time of great blessing to each one of us we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to sing our first hymn this morning. It's one that you should know from old days, in a way. <laughs> Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. <laughs>
Father, the Son, and the Spirit by your side. And Lord, these are not religious words. We don't want to join the religious boards. We want to join your people. We want to be one. We want to be known as those that live as well as talk the world. So Lord, we thank you now for the challenges you bring into our lives and the disciplines. And Lord, we do want to lift up our country to you at this moment. There is so much going on. So many cross communications going on as well, Lord. We need to just see you, Lord, in amongst all of this, that all this. But Lord, we pray for our government now. We pray for our new king. We pray for all that are in authority over us. Amen. But Lord, help us not to put those people over you. Help us always to put you central. And then, Lord, I pray for our governments those in authority, whoever they may be in this country, that they would be seeing the living God amongst them. That, Lord, they would see you and turn to you, because there is no hope without you. Lord, when we look at the history of the nations, when they've turned to you, they've prospered and been blessed and grown. So, Lord, help us to be that nation again that turns to you. And, Lord, when we look at the terrors that's awaiting people at this moment, when you know, just looking at the news makes our hearts tremble with that terrible disaster in Ireland, with the petrol station blowing up. Lord, we pray now for those mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters and families that have lost these young ones and lost their oh, mothers and fathers. Lord, this is so terrible, Lord, that they're lost for words sometimes. But Lord, we know that you oversee these things. So I pray that Christians would come out of woodwork as it were situation. And each of those families would meet with you, Lord, because of this terrible disaster. That goodness would come out of this terrible thing. And we must remember, Lord, as well, what's happening out in Ukraine. That, Lord, we do pray for the Russian people who have stood for you, the Christians that we sometimes forget because of the terrors of war. And we lift them up as well as the Ukrainian Christians who have stood firm. And Lord, even though we don't hear much of it at times in the main news, we know that your people are there. And we pray for those who've been put in prison, who've been sent to some of the worst gulags and places because of their stood firm. Go to them, Lord, in their cells at this moment by the power of your spirit and uplift them. And Lord, we do pray that this thing would not go down the road that it seems to be going down. But Lord, we also don't know what your mind is like. Just help us to be praying in the Spirit. So we pray the way you want us to pray, and not the way of the flesh. Guide us, Lord. Teach us, Lord, afresh how to pray in the power of your Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, fall upon us this morning and anoint this place. That when we leave here this morning, Lord, we will be changed as a people. Help us, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit, it's only through your way. By the power of Jesus and the Father's request that we come, that we can be changed. In Jesus' name, Amen. 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 We uh, watch the news, we worry, we fear, and we see what's happening, and that's where it's all going to end up. Mr. Boots keeping his mouth shut, yeah, he's not doing what he wants to do. But we read this morning, didn't we, in Revelation, that the Lord Jesus Christ is the first and the last, the only one in all things are under his control, he's the author and the finisher, and if we're in Christ, we're saved. Mm. Whoever comes out of this world, we belong to him, and we're saved. And that really is one of the great blessings of being part of his family. We don't have to fear what's going on in the world, we don't have to worry. And we're going to sing a song, My Guardian. And uh, it really is an encouragement to know that the Lord Jesus Christ is watching over each one of us, and we belong to him. He is our guardian.
And the reason that my mum thought like this was because she had a friend who emigrated to Australia when my mum was quite young, when I was about six. A friend went to Australia and she never settled down. She would work for two years and then she would come and live with us from here, go back to Australia, work for two years and come and live with us from here. Or she would work for two years and get my mum and dad to go in there. But she just could never settle because England was where her heart was, that was her home. It's where her treasure was. She just wanted to go backwards and forwards. And as I was looking at this passage today, I had to go back a little bit where we were last time because I think I missed the point. And so when we look into the story of Saul and David today, we're going to begin to look at it maybe the maybe second part of the story, but a different point of view. And the question I want to leave you is, where is your treasure and where is your heart? think the best one. Where is your treasure and where is your heart? Because it can be all-consuming. You know when you, um, maybe you want to buy, I don't know, we'll say a television, or you want to buy a car, or you're going to move home, or you might have a wedding to go to, and you're going to buy some new, new dress and hat and shoes for that. It can be all-consuming. You think about it all the time, you know. Some people even do research, you know, what's, what's the best television, or what's the best washing machine, or what's the best car? And it takes away your peace because your mind is focused on that. You your treasure is there, your heart is there, and it occupies you all the while, you know. And, and, you know, is that right? You know, the Lord Jesus Christ, he says, you know, where your treasure is, your heart is, you know, fix your mind on things above. So we'll look at those verses as well. But we're going to sing another song and then we'll, we'll have a look at God's word, okay? So the Lord is my shepherd. And I think it's the older version. Do they have the chords? Oh, was that the one with the chords, was it? It's a new one. Uh, it's a new one. Okay, I get one mistake. Oh, okay. Well, oh, maybe it's my name. That's the first one with the old version. I thought, oh, maybe it's more like that. I hope you just got the one with the chords. Okay. You never know. You never know.
verses that I was looking at, I was doing that talk at Dunham, and I don't know how you can pop them up on the screen, the Bible verse, just to remind ourselves of what the Lord said. Um,
sit and saw your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lot of people came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it rose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck it and killed it. Your servant still both blind and bare, his son's servant, so his first time will be like one of them. Sin is easy to the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the poor of the lion and the poor of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of his first time. When Saul saw, 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 there was no point talking and arguing with David, but he couldn't, because David had the right words. He said, go, the Lord be with you. See, David finishes with, it was God who delivered me. And he'll do it again. My trust is in him. The God of heaven's on my side. So the first day he says, so I said, well, okay, you go. You can go there, but you must put my armour on, because that's the way you go and fight, Giants. We, we put the armour on, we go out, we fight on our own strength, and you'll need, you'll need my armour to protect you. No man can go out there and fight the giant without armour. You've got to have it, you've just got to put it on. Because this is the way we do it as men. David does put it on for a moment, doesn't he? Puts it on with a bloody sword. He says, I can't go out with this. I just need the things I have. I, I need my shepherd's staff. I need my sling. Do you know, when God wants to use you, he doesn't say you've got to go and acquire this, you've got to go and acquire that, go and look for this and that. He says, I'm going to use you as you are. The Holy Spirit's going to come into your life, the Holy Spirit's going to come in over you, and you're going to do what I want you to work, what I want you to do, as you are. I will change you from within. You don't need to go and grab this or get this and have that. It's going to be done in the power of the Holy Spirit. Not the things of this world, not in man-made armour. Man made equipment. And David knows that it's possible to go and fight this giant because he's put his trust in God. And we can do the same when we face these obstacles. We can go out and face them if we're trusting in the Holy Spirit to be that help us. If we think we've got to take this and take that and do this and go through a different procedure, we're completely wrong. It's doing it in and through the power of God. And David knows this. David knows that in all honesty with everybody, he doesn't have any hope at all. But you know, as we saw a couple of weeks ago, he goes out in the power of God and he overcomes this huge man. And Saul sees all this. Saul's watching all this. But he doesn't see it as God doing a great thing for Israel. He doesn't see it that way. I mean, this turns out to be a huge, huge day, a huge, huge victory for Israel. You know, this, this man has been torn in Israel for 40 days and, four, and 40 mornings, 40 nights. And Israel is facing this huge challenge. And now Israel is free of it. And, and Saul just sees David as a, a celebrity, who's, you know, somebody who's won a great victory. And someone who could be very useful to his cause. He doesn't see it as God's work in there. He just wants this man. He wants him. Look, look verse 55, 56. When Saul said, saw David go and out against the first time, and he said to Abner, the commander of the army, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner says, Your soul lives to a king, I don't know. So the king said, Inquire whose son this young man is. Right? He wanted this young man on the team. He was a lucky charm. He wanted him. He wanted him to be with him. And so we're just looking at 18 2. Look. Saul took him that day. He wouldn't let David go home anymore. He acquired David. You know, he belonged to me. You're not going home anymore. You're mine. You've done something really great you know, today. You've really, you've really accomplished something today. But from now on, you're going to serve me. You belong to me. Saul doesn't see God in it. He's, he, he's seen that purely from the eyes of somebody who's looked at the world and the things around him. If he saw God in it, he would have behaved totally differently. But he can't. He just wants popularity on his side. He wants this young boy on his team. It's all about Saul and it's all about the crown. And this is what shapes the rest of Saul's relationship with David. So we look at 18.5, it says, And so David went out wherever Saul sent him, and he behaved wisely. And Saul set him over the men of war, and he was set in the sight of all the people, and also in the sight of all Saul's servants. And, and, and David is Saul's champion. He belongs to Saul. And David might be great. He might be great. But in Saul's eyes, all he is, is good for the kingdom. It's good, it's good news. It's good for my prestige. And then we, we looked at this last time, verses 6 and 7. Now it happened. It's happened the day after the battle, actually. Now it happens they were coming home from the battle. 
when they will return from the slaughter of the first times, the women of Cain and the cities of Israel, singing, dancing to meet King Saul, with tambourines, with joy, with loose instruments. And the women sang as they danced. They said, the women would be in groups, and they would be singing to each other. On one side they would sing, and Saul has slain his thousands. And the women over this side would reply, and David is tens of thousands. And when Saul hears this, he's furious. He's furious. Because as king, all the honor should go to him. All the honor belongs to Saul. This is where he, it belongs to the kingdom. This is where his treasure is. This is where his heart is. This kingdom is mine. And you're giving him some credit. It belongs to me. How dare you assign David 10,000? This belongs to me. And he can't see God's hand in this at all. Just somebody stealing his glory, <coughs> touching his treasure, taken from his position as king. But it's not his kingdom, it's God's kingdom. He completely misunderstands the situation. It says then Saul was very angry. And the son displeased him. And he said, They've ascribed only 10,000 to me, they have ascribed only 10,000. Now what more can he have but the kingdom? You see it? The kingdom's his treasure. His eyes are fixed on the kingdom. Not the kingdom of heaven, but his kingdom on earth. What a huge mistake. What a huge mistake. Saul's treasure is in danger. Maybe the people want David to be the next king. And this is all just too much for Saul. They're touching his treasure. All that Saul has staked his life on, you know, all his future is based upon this. His heart's desire. It all it seems to be under threat for a moment. In verse 9, so Saul lied David from that day forward. He's got his eye on him all the while because he thinks David's going to steal his treasure. It's just like being at Brian Norris and Lord gives you a bit of chocolate cake and all the while you're watching because you know the dog's going to nick it. <laughs> <laughs> so fast. <laughs> I've seen that. <laughs> Saul, <laughs> yeah, it is but it's, it, it, it's, it's how Saul is watching all the while. He just thinks David's going to steal his treasure. It's, it's, what, a, what a situation, what a way to live. All the while it's in your heart, you know, everything you love is under threat. And, and so he knows what David's doing, he knows where David's going all the time, he's watching. If you remember the, the last time we looked at this, it, it gets so much that Saul gets depressed about it. So much so that he, he throws his spear at David twice. Verse 13 it says, and therefore Saul removed him from his presence in there. He made him his captain over a thousand. He went out and he came in before the people. Why? Because he knows if he goes out to fight the Philistines, he could get killed. The Philistines might do the job for him, they might get rid of David. You know, when you fix your eyes on things below, it brings you low. It does. You start thinking lower and lower and lower. But David goes out and he fights the battles. And he comes back time and again. Why? Because all the while he's got his eyes fixed on God. He's fixed up there, not down here. He's going out continually in the power and the protection of God. And verse 12, what does it say? That when this happened, what does verse 12 say? Now Saul's afraid of David. Not only does he fear him, he becomes scared of him. Yet he's the one throwing the spear at David. He fears David, he's afraid of him. Verse 12 says he's afraid of David. Verse 15 says he's afraid of him. And verse 8 says he's angry. All his emotions are running through Saul because he's treasured on earth. He's got his eyes fixed on things down here and not on things above. And he's scared he's going to lose it. You know, when, you, when your treasure is not above, when your treasure is down here, and that treasure is threatened, you'll become angry. You'll become afraid. Because you think you're going to lose it. And we all know that. We've all probably experienced that. And the more you're afraid, the more angry you become. And, and, and you know, the more the threat increases, the more angry you get. And it can be enough to drive you crazy, as I was with Saul. Really got on top of it. And just to add to Saul's despair in the situation, what happens? It says, all Israel and all Judah, they love Saul. They love David. They loved him. And, and then we get to verse 17. It says, Then Saul said to David, said to David Here's my older daughter, Mary. He starts to remember that promise that he made. Whoever kills the giant will marry my daughter. 
He's decided to honour his word, right? He says, look, here is my eldest daughter Mary. I will give her to you as wife. Only be valiant for me and fight the Lord's battle. There's a little, there's a little catch here. Yeah, you can have my daughter back. You've got to go out and fight the Philistines. You've got to keep fighting the Philistines. Because hopefully one, hopefully one of them is going to get the better of you sooner or later. So he says, look, you know, just go and fight the Lord's battles for me. For Saul thought, let my hand not be against him, but let the hand of the Philistines be against him. If he goes out and he fights the Philistines, you know, he, he could get killed in the process. I hope he does. And I could actually pretend to be sorry about it. I could mourn for him. My hands would be clean. You know? And the whole, the whole situation would be gone. You know, the kingdom would be safe and secure with me. But David says, he says, no, who am I? He says, who am I? He comes out. Who am I? Who am I family? We're nobodies. But I should become the son-in-law of the king. Who am I? He's the man of the moment, David. He killed Goliath. He's winning victory after victory. And he's still humble. He says, I'm a nobody. Because he knows it's all from God. It's not him. He's a nobody. It's just a boy. Most of us would be like, you know, we'd be quite full of ourselves, wouldn't we? You know, look what I've achieved. Look what I've achieved. Not David. He's got his own fixed on things with that. He knows it's all coming from God. And he doesn't jump at the chance. In verse 19 it says there, but it happened at the time when Mary saw the Lord should have been given to David. She was given to Adriel. I don't know who I am. I don't know where he's at. His wife. So he, he doesn't, he doesn't uh, marry Saul's oldest daughter. Okay? And she's given to somebody else's wife. But then we get to verse 20. It says now Mitchell. Saul thought she loved David. And they told Saul, and the thing pleased him. He's pleased that his daughter loves David. Now you'd expect him to say his daughter, not you as well. Don't tell me you felt this way too. Everybody's gone chasing after David. But no, he's quite happy about it. Saul was happy about it. Why, why is he happy about it? We look at verse 21, he says, So Saul said, I'll give her to him, that she may be a snare to him. Whoa. What, what, what a piece of work she must have been, eh? Yeah, that your own dad would say that about him. Yeah, you can marry her, she'll going to be a real problem to him. What an awful girl she must have been, what? Maybe she wasn't, but Saul thought she could be. David, he could deal with Goliath, he could kill the giant, he could go out and kill the Philistines, but this girl's going to be a real headache to him. A real problem. And eventually she is, actually, and God deals with her. But for the moment, David is the one. Yeah, for her. The heart's fixed on David. And in an effort to convince David, Saul offers his servants. He says, Can I have a word in the ear of David? He says, Look, in verse 22, Saul commanded his servants, Communicate with David secretly and say, Look, the king has delight in you, and all his servants love you, and therefore become the king's son in law. And so Saul's servants spoke those words in the hearing of David. And David says, does it seem to you a light thing to be the king's son in law? Seeing I am poor and lowly and a lowly esteemed man. David said, It's a big thing to marry the king's daughter. I don't have the money, I can't pay the dowry. I can't afford her. This is ridiculous. She's too expensive. She's out of my league. And so the servants came back and they report these words back to Saul. <coughs> And Saul says, Thus you shall say, David, the king does not desire any dowry, but one hundred foreskins of the first line to take vengeance on the king's enemy. But Saul thought to make David fall by the hand of the first line. All that's in Saul's mind is to get David in dangerous situations, because sooner or later he's going to come to a sticky end. A lucky arrow, a spear or a sword thrust, now a slash with a sword. Something will get him, and then problem solved, the kingdom's safe. And, and, and also what he suggested to David is appealing to David's honour. And you have to remember that in the days of Saul and David, everything was about honour. And we'll see that later on as we move through the story. It's all about honour, family honour, individual honour. There's so much about it that we don't really understand unless you actually dig into it. But honour is everything. And this appeals to David's honour. Hey, but I'm not looking to give it to you, David. You're not going to get it for free. You've got to go out and, and you've got to go and earn it. You've got to go and kill me some Philistines. You've got to go and do some real dangerous work. I want you to go and kill a hundred Philistines and you're going to prove it by bringing back the ball skins. And you think, where is so 
school dream up this idea. It's absolutely horrible. It's gross, isn't it? Well, I can't imagine what was going through David's mind as he was thinking, yeah, I'll bring back the crew for this. But what's even more sort of weird about the whole situation is when the servants told these words to David, he was pleased. He said, David, what? What? And it says, because the days are not expired, well, well, the time limit hadn't come by. David sort of, sort of promised it, David, you've got 20 days to make up your mind or whatever it is, right? The, the marriage offer is still on the table. It's not being withdrawn. David says to his men, come on, lads, pick up your weapon, let's go. Let's go and get some first time. Please, David, you know, and, and he was pleased to become, he says, I'll be pleased to become the king's son in law. And that tells me that despite Saul's desperate attempts to kill David, you know, throw the spear out and all these things, you know, David put that all behind him. He forgave him, he moved on. He wasn't all that against Saul. He knew Saul suffered from these bouts of depression, but he was not resentful. And he says, Do you know what? I would be pleased. I would be honoured to be the king's son in law. But they're all behind him. So he goes out to kill the Philistines. But he doesn't kill 100. He doubles them. He takes 200. Verse 27 says there, David arose, went forth, he and his men, and he killed 200 men of the Philistines. Right? I don't know, I don't know. Hey, we, look, David brought the force against him, gave the force against the king. Hey, I can't think of that. I don't know how you <laughs> It's one of those passages I don't want to deal with. <laughs> but we have to. <laughs> but it's, yeah, it's awful, isn't it? You know, how do we, how do we get age around this? You know? It's a different age, it's all I can say. <laughs> but David gives, David gives me Shelley's daughter's wife. Uh, no, no. Yeah. Happy days, you say. He's got his wife, you know. This is all a happy ending. They're all going to live happily ever after. It's not quite, is it? Is it verses 28, 29? Thus Saul sought and knew the Lord was with David, and he shall his daughter love him. And Saul was still more afraid of David, so Saul became David's enemy continually. <laughs> it's that the in laws are at war. Well, one side of this, what did David do to cause this problem? Nothing. He actually did nothing. You know, we have to realize that you could have a, uh, a relationship completely falls apart and you don't have to do anything wrong for that to happen. The other part might hate you, you can't stand you, and you've done nothing to upset them. And we see a case of it here. All David has done is good for Saul. He's gone out, he's won victories for him, he's elevated the kingdom, he's secured the kingdom, he's made it a safe place, he's brought victory after victory, secured the territory. And the more good that David does, the more Saul hates him. You know, you can only be responsible for your relationship with another person. You can only live in peace with them as far as you can. And that's your responsibility to fulfill. But this does highlight that there's a problem, isn't it? When two people come together and their vision is not the same. Right? Saul's eyes are fixed down here, and David's eyes are fixed up there. David's eyes are on the things above, but Saul's eyes are on the things down they walk in different paths. That creates a problem. That creates that dude's problem for Saul and for David. Although David had done nothing wrong. The problem is, is that you, know, you see everything differently. And your eyes are in different places. You look up there, you see different what the person sees looking down here. One sees it in terms of what can I do and what can I get? While the other says, what will God do and what will God give me? How can I look after myself? How will God look after all depends on where your treasure is. Hmm. Or where your treasure is, then your heart will be also. Where is your home? Is it with the Lord? Is your home with the Lord this morning? Is your treasure up there? We used to sing a song years ago, you might remember it. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Remember it? Did you sing it? Yeah. Verse 30 says, Then the princes of the Philistines went out to war, and so it was whenever David behaved, went out, that they behaved more wisely than all the servants of Saul. So that his name became <coughs> highly esteemed. Things get worse and worse for Saul. 
his schemes work against himself, you know, whatever his schemes against David, they, they become more popular. The people love David more and more. You know, whatever Saul's schemes against David, God turns around and uses against him. He gives him great success. David's part of the family for a while. He's married to the king's daughter. The king's son is his best friend. The whole nation love him. And the only person who doesn't like David, who can't stand him, is Saul. He's out to live on his own. Eventually, you know, it's Saul who meets his death by the Philistines, not David. Proverbs 26, 27 says, If a man thinks a pet evil for him to it, God is sovereign, and his purposes always prevail. And they always. God will never fail. Never, ever fail. But it's a strange thing, you know, when we look around this world, and we look at the chaos, we look at the problems, we look at all that's going wrong, that some people still put their faith in this world, they're still looking for their treasure in this world. They'd rather look for hope down here than look for heaven up there. Hmm? Isn't it? They just hope that life down here might just swing in their favour for a short time, rather than to know that everything's going to be perfect up there for eternity. And Saul was a clear example of someone who's just hoping he can swing the, you know, the tide of events into his favour for a while. Using his own strength, using his own cunning, using his own plans. To say, it doesn't turn out well for Saul in the end, does it? You know, he eventually throws David out, David becomes an outlaw, living in the caves and in the hills. But that doesn't give Saul any peace. The only way for perfect peace is to fix your mind, fix your heart, and where your treasure at is, and that should be in heaven. So where is your treasure this morning? Where is your treasure? Think carefully about it. Where is your treasure? Jesus said this, we all know the words, do not know for yourselves treasure on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break and steal. And you'll lose it. You'll lose it all. But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. They're the words of Jesus, and he knows more than any of us. Think about it carefully. Where is your treasure? Okay. We've got the to finish this, but my hope is built on nothing less.
world is solid rock. And yeah. We look at this world, we don't have to look very hard to see that it is sinking sand. Yeah. People all around are in dismay, and people concerned about finances and where the situation is going to go with wars and with famine in different parts of the world. But we know that you are on solid ground. Mm -hmm. We thank you so much for the security that that gives us, Lord, in our heart, the contentment and the assurance that we know. That when you come, when that trumpet sounds, we've just sung, we'll be found in you, we'll go to be with you. Oh, Lord, thank you for the blessings you give us with that. Please be with us now as we share a time of fellowship together, have a tea or coffee, or when we go our way as well. Be with us and I love you.